Welcome to the Our Talk bus stop. I'm Emily Brown, and then our guest here is Kelly Rarr, and then we also have Erica here to help us produce. Um, so Kelly, what do you do as like your job, like work? I run my own company as a building construction contractor. I do tile and finish carpentry primarily. And then um, as a non-paid job, um, I am uh, one of a group of collective members who run a nonprofit, all volunteer run nonprofit called S1, which is a nonprofit uh, music and education space in Portland. So can you talk more about the S1? Yeah, I have been working with S1 for about four plus years. Um, S1 as a nonprofit is uh, five years old. We focus on experimental sound and music. Uh, We have a synth library that has all donated equipment, um, a lot of Eurorack analog synthesizers, um, keyboard synthesizers, um, other devices, pedals. Um, We've started a collection of video synth and glitch video equipment, which is really exciting. Um, our One of our main missions actually is to provide access and space and community for marginalized folks from the LGBTQ community to BIPOC um, and also supporting women, trans and non-binary folks to feel supported and comfortable in learning how to use um, lots of Uh, audio equipment and music gear so we do workshops classes um, we're also a venue so we do um, performances sometimes we do visual art exhibitions um, a whole host of things do you have like live performers like do your stuff like with the music or is like a teaching thing um all of the above so we have um Uh, Some of our members will teach workshops on how to use specific gear or how to use your rack or the foundations of synthesis. Um, We have a lot of DIY classes, so learning how to actually build electronics, which is one of the ways I got started. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we also do live performances um, for musicians and other um, types of performers. Mm. Okay, um, do you want to talk about your tile work that you make money off of? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think I'm like trying to think of what is uh, would be most uh, interesting and helpful for y'all to know about my trajectory. Um, in terms of the building work, um, it's been a really uh, important part of my income generating um options because it allows me a lot of flexibility and freedom to do the work that I really care about, which is uh, making my own art and also supporting the communities um, that I care about and music and other types of art. I'm able to craft my space and time in a much more fluid way that's in my control so that I can make space and time for volunteering and running S1. Hmm. But that's also been kind of the way that I've made my living the whole time so like out of high school into college um figuring out you know how can i craft my life in a way that um, i can make enough money to meet my basic needs but also not be so consumed with making money that i don't have any time to do the things that i really care about so that was that was a big thing leaving college was um figuring out how to be in the arts um without like a official arts degree. I think at one point I had five jobs. Wow. Um, I was uh, working in a restaurant. I was working as a gallery assistant and I was doing some house painting, which was my own gig I started, (laughs) painting my mom's friend's houses um, and uh, running, being a volunteer at a nonprofit art center. And so I was kind of crafting everything, Mm -hmm. all these random jobs so that I had my own time to to work and volunteer for this art installation nonprofit. Mm. So that's not a direct answer to your question, (laughs) but (laughs) I can talk more about my building work if that's useful. Um, So you said tile work? Like, Mm -hmm. do you make tiles or like? I don't make the tiles. Um, It's mostly installation. Mm, So yeah, yeah. yeah, people end up doing a lot of um, kitchens and bathrooms. 
that's usually where people want tile. Most of it's not super creative work. <laughs> it's usually creative problem solving yeah. that's required. But um, sometimes I get a really fun creative project uh, where I get to uh, be more involved in um, doing something more interesting with the tile, like picking a really beautiful type of tile that's not uh, that's a non-standard shape or um, helping someone design their look that they want. But yeah. usually it's pretty standard stuff. Are you like a company like owner? Like do you own your company? Mm-hmm. Do you have people work for you? Yeah. So I spent um, about two years working with my brother and a friend of mine, um, increasing my skills and, um, you know, not being the lead, but learning a lot. And then in um, January, I decided I wanted to start my own company. So I took all the tests and um, got my license and insurance and started my own company. And it's been a year um, that's been quite successful. Um, I've really only needed to have one assistant um, that comes on here or there. She's amazing, and I'm very thankful that she's been able to work with me. Um, It's kind of hard to find another person who has the skills um, who is a good worker and who is also available randomly and doesn't need consistent work. It's kind of boom or bust. You can get a lot of projects and then you might have a month and a half or more where there aren't any projects. So you need someone who kind of has their own also other things going on. Oh, was it difficult to like start up your company? Um, it wasn't. Um, I mean, it was difficult in the sense of, um, believing that that was something that I could do um, and um, getting myself to finally read the entire contracting book, (laughs) which is incredibly boring and is basically they just want to know that you um, know what, where to find the specific laws and codes. And um, it's an open book test. I was like really trying to be really good about it and like read the whole thing, Mm -hmm. but I really just needed to just schedule the exam Mm -hmm. and then show up and do it because it really wasn't that hard in the end in believing in my own capacity to run my own business um that felt like a really big step um that was probably the hardest piece yeah but it was all of my jobs have been referrals or friends that I know so so far I haven't had to do any major marketing or advertising and the jobs have just continued to come in and so I've been really grateful are you like based in Portland or do you go like spread out a little bit or just like I prefer that I don't have to commute more than 25 minutes <laughs> <laughs> 30 45 I'm less likely to take that job mm. yeah. unless they're willing to pay a trip fee or something <laughs> yeah um what do you love most about your job or like company um the freedom to decide how much work I have mm. Yeah, I um, am not interested in being a major stressed out um, hustling contractor who is exhausted and tired and stressed out all the time and stacking projects one after another just to like go get the money. Yeah. Um, so I've, I really appreciate that I can sort of have a really nice life work balance. That's been really important for me. I like to ask, what is your like daily routine? Um, well, I'd say my daily routine is that I don't really have one beyond what maybe my morning looks like. And then the rest of the day is dependent on if I have, uh, if I'm working on a project gig, um, or if I'm, uh, having to spend a day doing a bunch of admin work, or if I'm doing a lot for S1, Mm. um, you know, uh, a, a work day for building work is getting up early coffee, breakfast, maybe some exercising. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, I don't know that I really have a routine. I, um, I do feel like if you're interested, um, my sort of trajectory of what I did in high school and how I arrived at um, being able to run a nonprofit and be involved in the arts uh, would probably be cool to share with y'all. Yeah, go ahead. I did mostly theater and photography in high school. Um, I also was always a dancer. I grew up dancing, and that was a really important part of my life. Um, But I did not know in high school that you could get a degree in dance or that you could get paid to be a dancer. Um, I did not know really that um, 
you that there were that many options in the arts and being someone who also loves science I kind of had convinced myself that that was the path I was going to focus on despite that I basically lived and breathed art Mm -hmm. forever (laughs) um so um you know, actually doing theater set building was the, the the first time I realized that I loved building. That was actually where I started to gain a lot of my construction skills was through set design and building in high school. Um, and then in college, I s- continued to study photography um, and dance on the side, um, but kind of realized that um, I was not super into doing tech, theater tech. Uh, I had an op opportunity to do that at a community college that I went to first and I sort of realized that I maybe wanted to try a different trajectory and continue to focus on photography Um, and when I graduated from Evergreen State College up in Olympia Washington um, I was really eager to be involved in the arts Um, I was looking for something different and um, I discovered a little nonprofit art center called the Portland Art Center that was focused on installation art. And I kind of decided that that was what I wanted to do and I would um, figure out what jobs I would need to have um, in order to do that almost all the time. And in that environment, we were building walls and taking walls down and building structures for artists. And so I was working with artists who had a lot of different skill sets. And so through that job, I was like acquiring a lot more skills. I was also learning about nonprofit management and arts management. Um, and I d- basically stayed in arts management for the next five years, moving from nonprofit to professional uh, for profit galleries, doing a lot of preparator work. So, helping artists design their exhibition and install it. I worked with um, uh, PNCA, the art school in town, and mm-hmm. also OCAC, which is no longer there, um, with their student exhibitions. Um, coordinating and curating um, and just being around artists was like an incredible way for me to learn about my own art practice and um, it really felt like that was my master's like I at, at one point I, I thought getting a master's in arts was something I was like really wanted to do and was really important but I kind of quickly realized that I was getting a much better education by being surrounded by and working with artists all the time Um, And I got to see their trajectory from their idea to working through um, how to install it and, you know, final exhibition of their work and learning uh, the pitfalls and the things that they could have done better and how I might do it differently. So that was that was my master's. um, And it was really important time. And I think the thing that's important to remember, at least I thought it was really important, is like, every industry or art practice that I was interested in, there are ways to be engaged and to volunteer and to be an artist assistant or work with artists. And that is one of the best ways to learn more about the thing that you're trying to do. Um, And it's often really great and a great way to be involved in community and get to know more artists if you find places to volunteer um, because it can be entry points to like get into shows for free because you're running the door Hmm. or you know, helping clean up afterwards or helping set up, um, that can be a really great way to build community in an area of interest. Um, yeah. And that, it, that can sometimes lead to paid work, um, but often it's more about finding ways to support whatever it is that you're most excited about. Yeah, it's very interesting. How did you start like SI? You said someone passed it down to you. S1. S1, sorry. That's okay. Um, So S1 was run primarily by two founders, Felicia and Alex, and then a third person, Alyssa DeRubis, who's helped co-found the Synth Library. And um, it was primarily run by them, and volunteers would would help. Um, And they actually started a series called the Women's Beat League uh, about three and a half years ago. There was a whole series of workshops focused only for female, feminine, non-binary folks to learn everything from um, uh, record DJing, CD DJing, um, intro to synthesis, um, uh, like a, a whole series of workshops. And I thought that was really, really important. And it was really amazing that like every class had 20 plus people in it. And I thought what they were doing was really important. So I just kind of stayed really close 
Um, it was hard to volunteer sometimes, but I just kept showing up, kept showing up, being part of the community, participating, going to shows. Um, and uh, about a year before the Felicia and Alex decided to step down um, to pursue other opportunities, um, I got the opportunity to be a little bit closer and start being more like a staff person, um, even though everyone is a volunteer. No one gets paid to do anything yeah. at S1 um, right now. And so I just, I was able to, to come in and use my many years of, of art management experience to support something that I really cared about um, that was supporting a really important community for me. Um, and then when they stepped down, it was really like, is, is anyone around who wants to keep this going? And that was just the question, like, was there enough of us to come forward to take it over or was it going to be shut down? And thankfully and amazingly, um, there was a, about a group of nine of us, nine to 12, depending on the day or the month, um, who, were, who were really uh, focused on making sure that it survived and had a new future. So um, I just stepped forward and, and started being a staff member. I have a question. Can I jump in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you want to talk a little bit about the relationship between um, what you do at S1 and your um, work as a musician. Mm. Thanks. Um, yeah, the the programming that they were doing um, was essential for me as a musician um, and the development of my work as a musician. Um, I, like I said, I started in photography transferred that those skill sets into doing video work um, and video installations and then at a time that time I brought together dance work and video work and in doing video work I also started working with sound and then sound became more important to me and music has always been incredibly important to me um, as a dancer and and I kind of got to a place where I was like, I really want to be able to make my own sound and music for my video. Um, and I would love to, to be able to craft the music that I want to hear. Like I wasn't really hearing like real specific types of sounds or music that I was interested in making. And so I really started to shift my interest from video then more into music making. But it took a solid three years uh, for me to be where I am right now in terms of having equipment and being a producer um, and making music and playing live. Um, I have been um, grateful that I've had S1 and access to the equipment to learn what kind of equipment I wanted to work with, um, what type of instruments really called to me, um, and be able to feel ready to drop some cash on my own gear. Um, but I borrowed a lot, and I utilized friends' equipment and utilized my friends to teach me how to do things. Um, and I've had a lot of support along the way. And um, now I'm um, making electronic music um, with a friend of mine. We have a project called Carbon Dating. Um, it's all, we call playing live. So we play, um, we're not DJing, we're actually producing our music live. Um, we use a lot of various equipment from sequencers to synthesizers and pedals. Um, and we do a lot of the programming ahead of time, kind of working through song sequences, um, but then everything is played live um, when we perform. And I'm also trying to work on my own music development, but um, it takes time. And that's one thing that I've always really struggled with is like right now S1 needs a lot of my time and energy. And so that is a very easy thing for me to put my energy into. And it's hard for me to figure out how to develop my own personal practice and routine of sitting down in front of the equipment and making myself just turn everything on and start poking some buttons and making some noise um, and seeing where it takes me. If I'm working with a collaborator, then I feel like, oh, I have uh, someone that's helping hold me accountable. And I'm like, well, I said we have rehearsal, so I have to show up regardless of how tired I am right now. But if it's just for me and I come home from work and I've been swinging a hammer and heavy tools all day, the idea of like standing and playing music is really hard <laughs> to get me to do that so um it's it's a bit of a challenge but um s1 has definitely been a key 
component to where I'm at and my interest and ability to be making music right now. So you went from, you graduated high school and then you like went, you, you went to community college, right? Mm-hmm. And then you went to like, you another like, college. Another college. Mm-hmm. And then through that college, you like went through all of that, like volunteer work, was that what it was? After college? Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you like go to that? Like, how do you get to those things? Like, how do you? Like, Are you trying to ask like how she figured out who to volunteer for? Like how she accessed those communities? Or? Yeah. How does she like access them? There's actually quite a few moments for me um, where when I've been very intentional about what I'm wanting and really wanting a, a thing to happen, I somehow that thing comes into my life. I, I either notice it more, I stumble upon it, it, an opportunity comes up. And I literally was walking down the street, going to breakfast with a friend. And it had been a street, it was um, Belmont Street, that I'd walked down before. And literally the day before, there were no, there was no sign on this building. And the next day, it said Portland Art Center. And I was like, wait, what is that? I didn't see that before. Like, what is that? And I went home and I... I, I'm like, I think Google was a thing then. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, come on, it was. I know. <laughs> I mean, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I Googled it, and um, they had volunteer opportunities, and there was a little, there was an application, and I was really nervous. Um, I was like, oh, my God, this place is so cool. Like, I, I don't have any, I don't, I've never done this before. Like, are they going to like me? And I... Um, they really wouldn't have cared. I could have just walked in without filling out the application, but I totally filled out the application and I printed it out and I walked in and, um, you know, (laughs) honestly, there was a very beautiful man who walked through the door (laughs) and he was installing his show. Um, and I was like, I'm, I like got dressed up, you know, I was like, like I was applying for an interview. Um, and, uh, I was like, I'm really interested in volunteering. I, I, you know, I brought this application and John was like, you want to work right now? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I looked down. I was like, well, normally I'm not dressed like this. Uh, I was mm-hmm. like, I'm not in my work clothes, but I'll, I'm, I'll come back. And um, so it was really, honestly, my willingness to just show up and do whatever it took and show up whenever they needed me to. And um, so that one in specifically it was like, I was really interested. I was looking. I had my eyes out for the thing I was looking for um, and then did some research, you know, um, met with the people and then just kept showing up. And um, the other ways were going to shows, um, talking to people at those venues, finding out um, how that venue works. Um, Oh, it's a nonprofit. Is anybody paid? Um, Who is running it right now? Like, can I talk to them? Um, Usually people are pretty open to you talking to them um but it does take some initiative to um show up you got to go to the shows go to the productions go to the um spoken word or poetry readings or theater productions and find out who the director is talk to the actors talk to the artists and just ask them questions um people i think you will be surprised um at how open most people are There are definitely a lot of people who have a lot of uh, front that they put up and they're not interested in talking and like, so what? Like, go talk to them. And if they're not nice, like, don't talk to them again. Find somebody else to talk to. Um, But it's really just about um, showing up, engaging in some way, asking questions and finding out how you can be involved. Usually people are super, even if it's a for-profit space and you want to volunteer, they want your help. Mm -hmm. so that is the best way to get engaged is unfortunately free labor but it's also you have a lot of opportunities to increase your skill sets that way and then you meet more people did you do gallery work in high school and like how would you give any advice to us um the most experience I had was in the theater and I had a, a lot of opportunities to um be a lead role in productions, um, helping coordinate and set things up. So that was really like any opportunity you have to be on the organizing side is really, really beneficial and you will learn a lot. I'm sure you already are right now. 
Um, and I think um, it really depends on the thing that you're trying to do. Um, like I, I could have a lot of advice about like how to curate shows or like how to install work. Um, but I think um, being engaged with the artist, um, figuring out what it is that they're trying to communicate um, and figuring out what the best way is to get their message through. And sometimes that means like they have an idea and they have a goal, but their means of executing it or their idea of execution isn't going to get them to the right place. So figuring out, you know, are they on the right track? Uh, is their goal going to be best supported by whatever choices that they're making or the choices that you're making in terms of how the work is displayed um, or where it's presented? Um, and I think also really questioning the status quo. If there, are, if there is a certain way that you think things are supposed to be done, ask yourself why. Investigate, like, is that really important still? Is that important in this case? Um, is that the best way to do this? Or would it be better to challenge um, whatever way in which uh, it's quote unquote supposed to be done? Um, like, that was a big thing for me in um, being a preparator and running galleries was, there is a way to install artwork. There, it should be, you know, 55 to 54 inches on center from the floor um, and installed in this sort of linear way um, because that's the best way for the artwork to be received and it's at like general eye height and there's it's like museum standards and the lighting should be such and such way. But for me, sometimes even if it's paintings, maybe that's not the best presentation. Maybe all the paintings should be clustered together right next to each other on one wall and all the walls are empty, all the rest of them are empty. Or maybe they're all leaning on the floor. Maybe they're all hanging on the ceiling. Um, like really, I think questioning, you know, sometimes that method is the best because you're not trying to call attention to the installation. You really want the work itself to be seen and experienced. So I think just being aware of the the ways in which you think things should be done and if there's another way um, and thinking outside of the box always and questioning whatever box it is you think you're in or think you should be in um, just question 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 because sometimes it's the right answer but yeah. you don't know unless you don't unless you ask the question hmm. yeah. seems like good general advice for like life artists and <laughs> life <laughs> Um, well, we're close to time. Did either of you have anything else you wanted to say, ask, or add? Uh, no. Um, I just wanted to add that um, we at S1 um, are an all-volunteer run nonprofit, and there are opportunities for people to volunteer. Um, we have been working on um, how we can engage youth more, and we've been trying to figure out how we can do um, all ages shows more often. If we want to sell alcohol, then we basically have to make it over 21 or it's really hard to also allow um, people under 21 to attend our events. So we're trying to do more all ages shows. We are open to volunteers who are not 21 um, and we're interested in doing more youth programming. So there are opportunities for anyone in this class to be engaged. Um, you can come to our workshops. Our workshops are not 21 and over. Um, I imagine anyone 16 or over could come, and if you were under 16, if you came with a parent, that would probably be just fine. Um, and being a member of the Synth Library is $20 a month, and you get um, access to reserve time um, to have facilitated time in our library using all of the gear. And we have an incredible amount of gear that is currently underutilized. So um, if you're interested, we have a website, s1portland.com, and um, there's information on how to get involved. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Thanks for being thank on the you. show. Thanks for having me.